um, I found uh, the Ars Notoria to be one of the strangest uh, grimoires that I have ever come across. Uh, originally, I thought it was part of the Le Megaton because that's what a lot of other scholars said. But I'd soon discovered that uh, it wasn't. Uh, in fact, there's a reference in the Ars Notoria to, um, to the Le Megaton as if it was a separate book. So I uh, researched it and discovered that the oldest copy of the, of the Ars Notoria dates back to 1225, which is a lot earlier than most of the grimoires that we're familiar with. And uh, I found it was quite fascinating because the uh, many of the um, uh, verba ignota, the unknown words in it, were not um, not recorded in other grimoires. So it appeared to come from a completely different strain or stream rather. And in fact, when looking into it further, I discovered that it had come from a Greek original sometime in the uh, 12th century in, uh, in Constantinople or Istanbul as it's known now. And uh, when it was brought across by the monks um, fleeing from Istanbul, uh, it acquired a collection of Christian prayers on top of the, the words that were there already. And when I say Christian, I mean uh, Latin, Latin prayers because the original text is in Greek. And so these are a later add-on and in a way they're there to be, um, to, make the, uh, to make the text acceptable because it became a very um, widely distributed <coughs> Uh, manuscript <coughs> in um, lots of monasteries and it was read and practiced presumably by lots of monks and lots of priests because um, for them with a shortage of books and uh, easy uh, notebooks um, memory was everything and so there are various um, techniques for, for memory like um, visualizing the things that you're trying to memorize as if they are in a large palace. And when you store a fact, you decide which wing it goes into, which room it goes into, which cupboard it goes into, and which drawer it goes into. So when you want it again, you can in your mind walk back through all of the corridors of the palace until you retrieve the fact. That in fact works quite well, but um, the Ars Notoria is a completely different system and it consists of doing, visualizing the, the note, which are, are brilliant illustrations and um, calling out a list of names, which I suspect were spirit names, some angel names, um, possibly even some demon names at the same time whilst looking at the illustration. So the illustration, the note was not meant to be a talisman. It was meant to have some kind of effect on your mind so that then when you did study some other subject, it would be easily remembered. And um, I thought, well, this is just too good to be true. And apparently a lot of the students in the 14th, 15th, 16th century used it. And I thought, well, there's so many people using it, there must be something in it. So I experimented with it. And I was quite surprised to find that um, anything that I revised after having done the, the long-winded procedures seemed to sink in much faster and um, stayed in my memory. So that got me started. So I got copies of the various editions, or well, no, they're not editions, the various manuscripts of the Ars Notoria and the, the beautiful illustrations in there and assembled them. So in the first volume, uh, which is more, more like the, the scholarly uh, approach to the Ars Notoria, I have uh, no less than five complete sets of, um, uh, of note. And you can see that they are basically the same illustration, but redone each time by a different artist. So um, I then dug out the, the Latin um, of the prayers that go with them. 
And I experimented in using the, um, the Ars Notoria with the prayers and then also without the prayers. And I found that there was no, and, and I, I experimented with other friends who um, allowed me to use them as um, guinea pigs. And they found that um, there was no difference between uh, using the techniques with the prayers or using the techniques out after the prayers. So uh, I decided to set up a practical book, one that wasn't um, uh, encumbered with scholarly stuff and uh, bibliographies and things like that. Um, and uh, I decided to remove the, the Latin prayers because as far as the technique goes, it works just as well. Uh, the other thing about it is that um, not only did it work just as well, but it did work. Um, and so it's sort of surprising that this book has never been published before. The, the partial translation uh, by Robert Turner has been published many times. But the, the odd thing about that translation is he translates all of the Latin prayers in great detail um, into English, uh, but doesn't bother with the verba ignota, uh, except to just give a few samples of the words. Well, as I discovered with practical experimentation, it's the verba ignota that actually do the trick and the Latin prayers do not. So in the second, my second volume, I stripped out the Latin prayers and I made sure that the verba ignota were complete, uh, which they're not in Robert Turner. So that's why it became necessary to publish a second volume. And in doing so, I picked a French manuscript, which was, no, it is the, the most complete manuscript. It has um, detailed commentary on the original texts. And, um, but there's an awful lot of repetition in it. So I cut that back, summarized the method, uh, which I've described there, uh, added in the Berber Ignata and also one full set of the note. So that is why um, there's two such publications, uh, but you need to work them together. Uh, you can't just pick up the second volume and go in there and actually use it. You need to know a little bit of the background, which is in the first volume. So this took me a long way away from my, my previous uh, interest, which was the, the grimoires, which were concerned with uh, evoking spirits or possibly demons and and or angels, because in the Ars Notoria, there is no conception of invoking. There's no, you will come now, you will stand outside the circle. There's no use of magical equipment. There's no use of standing in a circle. Um, instead, it's a completely different procedure. And you start not by bossing around the spiritual entities, but you start by asking them for permission to use the system. And with the half dozen or so um, friends who offered to stand in and guinea pig for me, only one got the message that he shouldn't progress. All the others got a, a big yes. And the, uh, the actual technique um, reflects stuff that I've seen in the Greco Egyptian magical pyre. And it consists of writing the names of angels on, um, well, it would have been papyrus uh, in the Greek, Greco-Egyptian sense, but probably on paper these days. And then washing the ink off and then swallowing the solution. Um, this sounds very weird, but uh, after the, the, the various procedures, which I won't go through now, you are then told that you will experience a dream and the dream will very clearly tell you, yes, it's a go or no, it's not. And as I say, in, in the case of one, it was not in the case of the others, they got a very clear dream indication that they should proceed. So they did because they were quite keen to see if it really worked. And several of them want to know, will it work for other languages? Will it work for learning? Um, Greek, for example, or will it, will, will it work for programming languages? And we tested both of those things and it indeed did seem to work very well for that. 
So um, I was quite pleased. So here we have um, a grimoire that is not really a grimoire, a grimoire that doesn't boss around demons and, and spirits, but a grimoire that probably has their names in the long list of words that you have to say at the time when you're looking at the note. And the note you cannot see in any other grimoire. If you look at your average talisman, you will find various formats of it in other, other grimoires. But um, with the note, they are only found in Ars Notoria. So um, I looked at who were supposed to have been the authors. And of course, the, the cardinal author is uh, King Solomon, because he's always associated with books of magic. Um, he was obviously very into it, um, although it's so long ago that um, nobody has uh, got any proof of that. Uh, but the second um, supposed author was Apollonius of Tyana. And Apollonius is a very interesting guy. Um, he lived about the same time as Jesus Christ. And he repeated in front of large audiences the number of the, um, the miracles that Christ did. Uh, so I thought that's, that's pretty fascinating. Um, and then he also set up large images, um, magical sculptures, if you like, uh, in various towns in what is now um, Syria and uh, also Turkey. And these had apparently an immediate effect, like for example, in one town, they were plagued by storks. Now you don't normally think of storks as bad birds, but these birds apparently made a habit of picking up poisonous snakes and dropping them in the water supply. Not desirable. But anyway, um, he arranged, or I suppose he got contractors to build uh, three storks in a large statue. And apparently they stopped this really antisocial behavior. And he did the same in a number of other cities. And in fact, some of the um, some of these uh, engraved stones um, still exist. And I, I put a picture of one of them in the, in the book. So you can look at it yourself. Um, and it involves angels' names. So I thought uh, he probably wasn't the author of Ars Notoria, but he's the sort of guy who could have been. And then another author that was listed was Euclid, um, not the... Um, not the, ge um, the geometer Euclid, but uh, Euclid of Thebes. And that's not Thebes in Egypt, that's Thebes in Greece, which was quite a large town. And um, he is famous for being the father of um, a guy who allegedly wrote the Liber Juratus. And so we probably know that this is true because if you look at uh, Liber Juratus, which is sometimes called the Sworn Book of Honorius. Um, there are a number of prayers in there, and they match, or at least 74 of them match prayers in the Ars Notoria. Uh, which came first, which was the chicken and which was the egg? The Ars Notoria came first. So I suspect that um, his contribution was actually adding the Christian prayers. Um, which I have rather high-handedly removed in my second volume. And then um, a third uh, author was reputedly the prophet Mani. And Mani started Manichaeism, uh, which still exists today, but only in a few obscure places in Iraq. And uh, his big thing was a holy book, which um, had many paintings inside it. So he added in the image side of the, the equation. So there you have Solomon with magic, um, Euclid uh, with the prayers which were later passed to um, the Sworn Book of Honorius, and Mani who was into images, and Apollonius of Tyana who was into magical images or magical sculptures. So they all seem to me to be likely contributors, which is um, a bit strange because usually you only have um, fictional authors for grimoires. 
So again, the asymptoria is quite different from the, the usual run of grimoires, uh, which is why it really caught my attention. So what else can I say about it? Well, the, um, you really got to look at the note to fully appreciate them. And the note are there um, to stimulate your knowledge of, um, to stimulate your knowledge of the classical subjects. And the classical subjects um, from the 13th century and before were divided into uh, the trivium, um, which is a word which translates into English as trivial, uh, which is a bit strange because they're not trivial. Uh, the quadrivium, which is another group of subjects, and then the postgraduate subjects. So let me just look at these again and see if they have any sort of relevance to the 21st century. So the trivium had three subjects, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Now, nowadays schools have stopped teaching grammar, which I personally think is a pity because it's useful to know the structure of a language if you're writing or even thinking in it because we all do think in a language. So that, um, that helps people understand the structure. Now, the second subject, logic, um, is very valuable. An awful lot of people, um, particularly on Facebook, who are not terribly logical in their uh, explanations. And then finally, rhetoric, which is the ability to speak out and explain things clearly. So although these are no longer taught in school, um, logic and rhetoric are particularly useful. So if you use Ars Notoria for either of those subjects, you will find in the case of rhetoric, I had one friend who did Ars Notoria for rhetoric and found that he could explain things and uh, defeat arguments and uh, uh, much easier than he ever could before. And the one who tried logic um, found it very useful in his, well, his work was uh, as a computer programmer. So I suppose that figures, but I was surprised. The second group of subjects that the Ars Notoria deals with is the quadrivium, and these are number related subjects. So that included arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, because of course for astronomy, you need to work out um, positions of stars in the sky, which is, uh, which requires um, a very specific geometry. And then lastly, music. Uh, we don't normally think of music as a hard boiled numeric subject now, but in those days, it was, um, music was seen as a collection of notes which had um, arithmetic uh, ratios between them. Uh, I'm not a musician, but I'm sure if you ask any musician friends, they will confirm that um, mathematics has a place in music. So um, one of my uh, test subjects uh, used the Ars Notoria for geometry. And uh, he says that was very successful, but um, I can't give you the details. And then outside of those subjects, uh, there was medicine, uh, which is not really well uh, covered by the Ars Notoria. And I'm not sure that anybody would want to learn medicine as it was taught in the 13th century, but, uh, but who knows? And then philosophy. And uh, one of my colleagues used Arsentoria for philosophy, which is the subject he teaches. And he says that his work was improved a lot. He also did logic and the two fit together rather nicely. And then the very last subject, um, that's extensively covered is theology. Now, these days, theology is not a, a number one headline subject unless you're thinking of becoming a priest. So none of my experimental subjects uh, tried theology. And then beyond that, um, there, was, uh, there was, in fact, an Ars Notoria format for learning magic but the details are very, very scanty. So um, unfortunately, because I was looking forward to seeing how that worked. So those are the subjects, but what you really got here are ways of thinking. So that when you do logic and rhetoric, um, you finish up being able to make the most persuasive arguments to convince people of what it is that you're trying to tell them. 
Um, grammar, um, grammar, I think, certainly helps with learning foreign languages. Um, I use uh, Ars Notoria to help improve my knowledge of Greek, and I certainly found it much, not only much um, more effective, but actually much easier to to memorize the huge number of cases that you can find in Greek. I mean, Greek is way more complicated than Latin and, and which is way more complicated than English. I think we're lucky to be speaking English because um, it is not the most horrendously difficult language. There are many other languages more difficult. Okay, so, so much for the experimental side, so much for the subjects um, and so much for the procedure. Now, I noticed that somebody asked the question, what about the pronunciation of the words? Now, we tried just pronouncing them as if they were Latin, which is just almost exactly as they're written. Uh, in the case of Latin, U, V, and W are uh, sometimes a bit mixed up. But uh, we just read them straight off the script, as it were. We looked at the note, and it worked. So I don't think you should have too many worries about that. Besides which, there are many, many um, uh, Berber ignota in there. And if you mess up one or two, I don't think that really matters. Uh, that's an interesting question. And I don't know the answer to it because I didn't test that. Uh, but it seems to me that it is much broader than just the intellectual side of things, you know, because um, so maybe you could uh, find learning an instrument easier. I don't know. Somebody else is going to have to experiment with that. Um, but certainly the, the other topics like uh, rhetoric and so forth are a lot wider than just um, academic rhetoric. And they're a lot more practical <clears throat> to be able to um, to be able to put thoughts together in your head and ex explain them clearly um, is almost um, visceral rather than um, academic. Uh, but of course, originally it would have been designed um, for the monks who had to remember vast amounts of theology and prayers and so forth. And uh, maybe the reason why it passed out of, um, out of common use is because the monks, um, I don't know, I don't know why it passed out of common use. Uh, one or two copies were burned. Um, the ecclesiastical um, establishment, I don't think liked it very much because they saw in there the names of what they thought might have been demons. And although it's not expressed as calling demons, it's not, um, you know, come now um, in the name of, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're just words. So reading the verb or ignota are like reading a shopping list, just one word after another. There's no grammar, there's no connecting words, which also seem to be very strange because with um, any magic, if you're working with invocation or evocation, it will be um, it'll be a sentence. It'll be an instruction. There's there's no alchemy in here. There's no one. There's no chemistry. Um, strangely enough, um, the the overlap with the Lamegaton was almost an accident of history because the um, the Arsentori at one stage made a mention about the Lamegaton. And then people push the two texts together sometime, um, probably early 1600. Um, yes, but there's one or two fascinating words amongst the verba ignota. And one is that the, the word Allah is mentioned 10 times. So um, that would suggest there might have been some Arabic um, uh, incorporation in it but not anything that you could track back to a particular Arabic text. Because remember that um, the two main streams of Western magic are, um, first of all, the grimoire stream, which I'm, which I'm always talking about, I guess, 
um, which relies upon invoking or calling particular entities, particular spirits, particular demons, charging them to do a particular task, binding them, and uh, then waiting until they get on and do it. Um, the other stream is the um, uh, is more Arabic derived, and it consists of very precise um, astrological calculations uh, to figure out a particular half hour or hour in which time a specific, very specific talisman should be written. The idea being that um, if you pick the time right, then the influence of that time will be incorporated in the talisman you're writing. This, this also has an interesting overlap in uh, Chinese Taoist magic, where um, timing for talisman writing is also key. So those are the two main streams. Um, but the Ars Antoria stands by itself. It certainly doesn't have any complicated astro um, astrological uh, requirements. It suggests cycles which are basically um, to start on a particular date and then uh, do different, um, different procedures uh, successively over a period of, say, three months. I thought three months, that's quite long, but it's not bad if you can absorb an entire subject in three months. Um, somewhat better than Abramelin, which takes either six or 18 months, depending on which source you look at. Uh, so I don't know whether that quite answers your question, but the, the Arsentoria really sits in a category all by itself. I would like, uh, I would like to have been able to put it in a box, but I can't. And um, I think the, the most interesting thing is that it works. Oh, um, I'm always very keen on circles and structures in uh, the usual grimoire magic, but this has no nothing that you couldn't do in a monk's cell. No need to inscribe anything on the floor. Um, there are prayers to be done beforehand, but uh, I found that they didn't have any particular use. Um, there's no sigils to be drawn. Uh, there's no talismans to be drawn. There is nothing, um, nothing beyond, and the phrase is quite interesting, inspecting the note. So originally I thought, well, I'll copy the note out, uh, which is quite a task in, in the case of some note, but I don't think that is even what it meant by inspecting. So in the end, I just got to, um, letting my vision meander over the, over the image and just um, see what, uh, what, what arises from that. Uh, but at the same time, of course, you are saying the, um, the verba ignota. Now, ideally with all forms of magic, you should memorize what you need to say so that you are um, not obsessed by reading the piece of paper you've got in front of you. I never quite got there. Um, in the case of Ars Notoria, I always read the note, uh, read the um, verba ignota, then looked at the note, and, and then looked back at the verba ignota. And that seemed to work. So I didn't push it any further. So it doesn't have the same structure. The, the main structural difference is that um, you had to ask permission to start with. Um, and the procedure that goes with asking permission might be construed as calling the angels to, to give you permission. Um, but it, again, it doesn't have any physical structuring. There's no, there's no need for a sword. There's no need for a wand. Um, but then, of course, the things that you can't do with it is you cannot uh, provide exterior world results. Like you can't ask for money. You can't ask for um, a new lover. You can't ask for all the many things that the, the grimoires do. You can't ask to catch a thief. So it doesn't have the, the, the practical outcomes that grimoire magic uh, addresses. It is purely designed to make your, uh, your brain more easily able to absorb a mass of new information. 
And I mean, maybe it just has the, the remarkable effect of relaxing you so that then things become uh, easier to absorb. Or maybe it has the effect of keeping you alert so that you don't go to sleep while you're reading a textbook. Because it does say that you should dip into your textbook at various points during the course of the operation. And maybe um, thinking about stuff that I've read in psychology, maybe it has the advantage of making you less worried about it. Because I know that in cramming for exams, um, when I stopped worrying about whether I um, memorize everything in time for the exam, uh, in fact, it was easier to, to memorize stuff. So maybe there's an, an element of that. Um, although there's not um, astrological uh, conditions like you, um, you, you observe the moon cycle, but that's that's fairly straightforward. You don't have to worry if uh, a plant, particular plant is combust or if the ruler of the current hour is um, uh, a planet that's congruent with what you're attempting to do. You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, so in a way it's a lot easier, but it also requires you to come back every day at a particular time of the day to do the procedure again, look at the note. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues said that um, he found studying a blessed relief from having to say out the, the lists of the verba and note, uh, or when we were trying it or reading out the prayers. So um, maybe the brain is, is fixed in such a way that um, after being belabored with all these words and things, it just goes, oh my God, here's some logical textbook stuff that I can read and learn. But that's only me being uh, speculative about it. Um, I don't know what the, the mechanism is. I don't know whether you can do multiple languages over the same three months. I wouldn't like to try, but uh, somebody's got to try it to, to see if it works. Um, yeah. I, I don't see why not, except that your days are going to be extremely full if you're um, dipping into textbooks in several different languages, as well as reading out the, the verba ignota and examining or inspecting the note. It didn't put me into meditative state. Um, I think as far as I was concerned, um, I was much more alert rather than meditative. The, the operation seems to have, uh, as I say, uh, the, the brain seems to like the break from the, the tiresome lists uh, to, to take time off to actually digest a real, a real textbook subject. Um, yeah, there's no, no cross eyes and um, crossed legs or anything else, um, or even closed eyes. You've got to keep the eyes open because you've got to inspect the, the note. So it is really completely unlike any uh, magical system. I think that um, religious persecution must have probably closed it down. Um, looking through the more than 100 manuscripts, and I've looked now at almost all of them, the vast majority have not got the note, um, which is why I re reproduced the note in, in five examples of the note, because many of the manuscripts do not have uh, the note, they've just got the prayers and uh, complete or incomplete verba ignota. Um, some of you will have uh, read Claire Fanger's um, uh, works about this. Um, she was concerned with a derivative text, which was written by John and Maringi. And he, he was very religiously inclined and his attempt were to purge the evil out of the Ars Notoria. And the result of that is that, um, first of all, he purged most of the, of the verba ignota, the magical names, and most of the, um, most of the note. So he was coming back to just a written thing. And then he inserted a lot of prayers to the Virgin Mary. 
thinking that that would be much more effective than some strange um, collection of foreign words that he'd never seen before. And he actually revised the text three times um, before he was satisfied with it. But the, the irony is that um, if you read his history, um, if you read his history, you will see that he's in fact schizoid before he even came across the Ars Motoria and was having fearful visions of being pursued by a, a monstrous devil-like creature. Uh, when he was living, I think, in Chartres and uh, rushing into the local church to appeal to the Virgin Mary to save him from this. And then after the Arzentoria, he still continued to have these, these terrible visions. So I think that probably um, whatever he had was uh, embedded long before he came across the Arzentoria. Uh, but by making it more and more religious, he eliminated the note, he eliminated this and that. And what he was left with, um, which is the thing that uh, Claire and a couple of other academics have looked at, um, is just a pale shadow of the Ars Notoria. Um, yeah, um, but much more Christian, of course. The, the most notable um, uh, mental change is a much greater degree of attention. Um, I didn't, um, yeah, definitely a greater degree of attention, but uh, there's no memory tech embedded in it. If you wanted to go and do the, the memory palaces, that's a completely different subject. And that doesn't even market itself as magic. It's just um, visualization technique, which I have used in the past and is, is quite valuable but it doesn't have the, the snap it into place that this that the Ars Notoria has. The Ars Notoria seems to be a lot easier than memory tech palaces um, because they require an awful lot of association and so forth. Um, the, the first uh, manuscript of this, which is um, kept in the Benanke, Benanke um, library in, uh, where is it? Uh, Yale, Harvard, can't remember, probably Yale, um, was probably written in Bologna uh, in 1225. It's, um, it's very clearly dated, but uh, 1225 in Bologna, there were a lot of people also doing the other memory text stuff. Uh, a couple of famous, uh, I, I came across at least four uh, people who were involved with the art of not notoria, but notoria, because they were concerned with copying out uh, legal documents and things, not necessarily memorizing them. So a lot of this thinking was going around at the same time. But um, this thing stands by itself. Um, memory tech with the palace and um, rooms and corridors and catchwords um, never says it's magic and it doesn't work like magic. But this stuff, um, where you just find yourself uh, going very rapidly through the, the textbook that you're, you're trying to, as it were, swallow um, and retaining a lot of it, uh, which is um, quite useful. Most complete Latin version, which has uh, got version A and version B in it, was um, a French manuscript, um, which is what I used in the second volume. And uh, there are uh, digital copies of it floating around. Let me see if I can give you some idea. Okay, I can't remember the manuscript number, but it's the Bibliothèque, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's, it's a beautiful volume. Um, it's folio, so the pages are very large. And they crammed into every page, tiny little, um, but beautiful handwriting. Um, almost every spare space is, is filled. Um, and I've, I, I had a digital volume a version of it. So I had to magnify it a number of times to actually be able to read it. 
Uh, fortunately, Veronese has um, transcribed the Latin, so there's a printed Latin version, which uh, will save you a lot of hassle. Um, so I use that uh, to produce the um, the stuff in the second volume. Yeah, it's it's a Bibliothèque Nationale um, nine three three six, so that most complete um, version. But um, yeah, Veronese's transcription of that is um, is what you if you can read Latin is where you should go. If you can't read Latin, then you're stuck with. Um, with my translation and uh, what I put into the second volume. But I cut out a lot of the, the repetition. The, the book continually tells you who wrote it, continually tells you how terrific it is. It's patting itself on the book, on, on the back all the way through. So I chopped a lot of that um, and uh, just took out the bones, as it were. This is what you do, and, and these are the days you do it on and when you should start and which subject and how you should go about it. Um, yeah, um, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't use audio books. An audio book, I guess, is the, um, is the modern equivalent of a, of a parchment um, from the 13th century. And listening uh, is going to be just as good perhaps even better than reading. So I think that's, that's probable. With regards to modern subjects, uh, one of my colleagues tried it for computer programming. And he says it, it definitely worked for that. It sharpened his ability to see um, how the program should be shaped. The, that was the logic bit of it. And um, uh, yeah, so you can extend it. I mean, what you can do with it um, depends upon somebody actually trying to do it. It's like uh, grimoire magic um, when you evoke a spirit. The spirits have what is called a list of their offices, in other words, what they do. You know, spirit A will um, find you a new lover, spirit B will find you um, um, goods that have been stolen by some thief and force the thief to return them, uh, which incidentally is, is one procedure I've tried successfully three times. Um, and Spirit C will um, uh, find a book for you. Um, one of my French colleagues, uh, and I'm talking about uh, 25, 30 years back, said that he had difficulty finding or locating um, magic books. So he actually asked one of the spirits to, to do that for him. And he was just amazed and overwhelmed by the number of people, complete strangers who would email him or in those days, phone him up or write him a letter saying, oh, we happen to have a copy of this. Are you interested in buying it? Of course, it didn't come like magic and plop on his desk. That doesn't happen. Uh, but it came through the normal channels and he had to, of course, pay for it. Um, sometimes quite reasonable prices, uh, one or two not so reasonable. So those are the, the, the physical things that um, grimoire magic can do. Um, Ars Notoria doesn't do the physical things, um, but it enables you to absorb and comprehend. Uh, perhaps I didn't um, stress comprehend enough because um, one of my colleagues said that um, he had found the subject he was trying to learn incredibly complicated. Um, and he couldn't really follow uh, what the, the teacher was saying. And so he did these procedures and um, he found that in class, suddenly there was a lot more clarity and he could understand what was being talked about. Um, now, of course, you can always say this is just subjective. And uh, it's it's um, it's not real. But my my experience of it is that it, the um, ability to absorb is definitely a lot a lot greater than it would normally be. And I'm reasonably good at absorbing material very fast, but uh, this improved that. Nobody in the 21st century been doing it for long enough 
to know what the real answer for that is. Um, so far, I haven't seen any appreciable loss um, over a period of time. There's certainly no more loss than you might anyway if you studied a subject. Um, there doesn't seem to be um, there doesn't seem to be a penalty. Um, I see one of the questions was, are there any no-go areas? Well, with grimoire magic, the no-go areas like you don't step out of the circle. Uh, with this, it's a little bit more forgiving. You forget to do your um, your procedure at matins, um, and so you just pick it up at the next hour uh, because it uses ecclesiastical hours throughout the day um, to tell you when you can do things. And that could be a little bit irritating, but in my head, I just translate them to um, uh, to Solomonic hours. But um, uh, it does seem to be fairly forgiving. If you mess up on an evocation, then either the spirit doesn't come or the spirit is difficult when it does come or even argumentative. Um, with this, if you mess up, well, you're going to do it again tomorrow. And you're going to do the same thing again tomorrow. Um, so um, you can catch up. I can uh, obviously read Latin and Greek. And so I can recognize typical, um, typical uh, Greek endings for verbs. And I can recognize typical Latin um, endings. And I also notice typical um, Hebrew endings in there. In fact, I did a, an analysis. Let me see if I can find it of the, the different languages. And I think the, the, the majority were Latin followed by Greek, followed by Hebrew. And then finally the smallest one was Arabic. So you can see words that look as if they should be Arabic. You can see words that look as if they should be Greek or Hebrew. But because these are not sentences, and so they don't have a structure that you can figure out, uh, it's hard to tell. Um, also, because when people copy words they don't understand, gibberish becomes more gibberish with every um, recopying. And as they've been recopied probably many centuries before the, the 13th century, um, it's almost going to be impossible to say, track some of them back to Babylonian or um, Chaldean or whatever. I could um, perhaps plead guilty to being too lazy. I did not go through every dictionary that I could lay my hands on to check every single word. I took samples. Um, so I suspect they could certainly go back a long way but I can't say how far they go back. There are, of course, um, proper nouns in there as well. So there are the names of the, the four angels, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, and uh, Michael, um, but only two or three, um, only two or three cases of each of those. Um, but, and also there's one or two demonic names that I recognize in there, but it's not consistent. You, you don't see masses of these things that are easily recognizable. And so there's always the possibility that the, the four archangels names have popped in later, or maybe that they were structural. But as the, as the instruction is to read every word in the verba ignota, um, that's, we, we never got around to sort of leaving out some names and adding in others because I wanted first of all to give it a fair a fair track you know a fair chance of working. So um, how far does it go back? I don't know. I know definitely the the manuscript went back to um, to Greek and I, I know definitely now that the the Latin prayers were subsequent editions um, possibly added by Euclid uh, of Thebes. Um, and how can I tell that um, it goes back to Greek? Uh, well, that's because of an interesting piece of architecture. 
when I was wandering around uh, Istanbul years ago, I went into one of the um, huge water systems under, under the city. And the particular water system, um, which by system I mean something that stores fresh water for people to drink, uh, was called the Basilica. And the reason why it was called the Basilica is that it was so huge. Uh, the estimates are that it would hold 100,000 tons of water, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. So I went, I went down to have a look inside because tourists are allowed to go down and have a look around. And um, obviously, most of that 100,000 tons of water uh, had been drained because you can walk around more or less dry at the bottom. And um, I noticed two pillars. Oh, incidentally, the whole, the whole system has a stone roof and it's held up by, by pillars. And where did the pillars, it was built in the sixth century uh, by Justinian. Where did the pillars come from? Well, Justinian had scant regard for pagans and scant, even worse, less regard for their temples. And so he sent his stonemasons and troops out, ah, oh, thank you, and found um, the pillars that you can see in the background there in various pagan temples and ripped them out and took them back to Istanbul. Um, but there are two very weird ones. The one you can see there, uh, the, the pillar is standing on an upside down Medusa head. So, um, I even figured out roughly what temple that Medusa head probably came from. So Justinian had taken it, but then to stand the pillar on it upside down, apart from being a deliberate insult to the, the, the pagan temple that it came from, uh, must be pretty unique. There cannot be very many of those in the whole world. And if you look up a little bit on the same page, you can see that two of the note are actually drawings of this pillar and even the things that look like springs coming out of the side um, are actually uh, a sort of um, drawing of the archways in the distance so if you look at the photograph you can see two lines going out between the curve and then the note um, there are about four lines on the other side which could easily have been other archways so uh, at that point i wasn't reading ars notoria i'd never seen the note but when I saw the note, the first thing that hit me was that note or those two note could only have been drawn in uh, by somebody who knew this system in Istanbul. Uh, and therefore, I can be certain that the um, Ars Notoria, if it wasn't generated in Istanbul, then at least it passed through there and one of the artists added in those two um, note illustrations. So that I thought was the most concrete evidence I've seen of, of, of where something came from. Where it started beforehand, um, who knows, but it certainly passed through um, Istanbul, Constantinople, and it would certainly have been written in Greek at that point. Uh, therefore, there would have been no Latin Christian prayers in there. So I felt completely exonerated when I cut those out as being later additions. Now, before um, Constantinople, uh, which would have been at least sometime before the 12th century, um, it may well have come from Syria because of the stress laid upon it. Uh, Apollonius of Tyana is one of the authors. So going back any further than Constantinople is purely uh, hypothetical, but I think it's quite likely that it came from Syria or Turkey to Constantinople, from Constantinople across to Bologna, and then it translated into Latin and distributed around um, the various monastic libraries in Europe. And as I said, there was more than 110 of these manuscripts, but um, the vast majority was, were missing the note. So in your average, um, your average uh, monastery library, uh, Ars Notoria would have just looked like uh, a book of prayers. 
and probably for that reason it survived. Um, God knows what people would have made of the note, but they certainly would not have thought them to be um, good. Uh, <clears throat> so there you have a little bit of history. No, I think that there was definitely some timing there. And the, it was conveniently changed to ecclesiastical hours. Um, I don't know offhand if ecclesiastical hours are part of the, the, the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, Orthodox Greek tradition. They're certainly part of the, the Latin um, tradition. But I think before that, they may well have been planetary hours. But that's just me guessing. Um, certainly the, the structure of when you do these things is um, quite, uh, quite rooted in the ecclesiastical hours. But then you'd expect that because there were monks using this book. And so they would have been doing, um, doing things by these hours. Uh, somebody asked, do they come from the Eleusinian mysteries? Well, that's an impossible question because um, nobody really knows what happened in the Eleusinian mysteries. Um, everybody knows the outer framework that um, postulants would walk from Athens to Eleusis and then um, undergo various uh, uh, trials and then they would see something which then changed their life permanently. Uh, because very few of them ever uh, put onto writing what they had seen there because they'd taken vows which they took very seriously. Um, I thought about this. So the short answer is uh, I couldn't say whether it came from the Eleusinian Mysteries because nobody really knows what was in the Eleusinian Mysteries. So just... Um, because of this, I visited uh, Eleusis some time back and I was amazed that it was virtually, uh, there's this site with a lot of buildings, a lot of stonework and things. Um, and there wasn't even a guard at the gate or the door. Nobody was asking me to pay for admission or a ticket. So um, I, I went there by taxi and uh, we walked in and walked around. But, um, of course, you can't just by wandering around a building figure out what, what had taken place there. But there were one or two interesting things, like one was a large, um, uh, sorry, it was a very small temple um, dedicated to Hades or, or Pluto. And at the side of it, there was a, a, a crack in the rock. Um, and that crack in the rock uh, according to the time of day, was either very dark and very deep or almost non-existent, probably because of the way the sun moved around. But you can see the Eleusinian mysteries, which focused on uh, Demeter and Persephone and her descent into the underworld, definitely have underworld connections. Um, uh, I mean, the only other thing that people said about it was that it it, as it were, set you up for your life after death. Um, possibly if it involved a visit to the underworld, then you would not have been particularly worried about that at the end of your life because you'd already been there. But I'm only speculating there. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a whole area which uh, it would be very good if somebody could figure out. Um, a couple of people like McKenna, have suggested that the, the, the Kikleon, the drink that was drunk at the um, Eleusinian Mysteries was made out of, um, I think it was barley. And McKenna thought that um, it was probably barley with ergot fungus on it, um, which means that uh, people would have been drinking ergot. Now, ergot is the, the chemical starting point for manufacturing LSD. And it certainly has um, that kind of effect on people, although it also has some un pretty unpleasant effects. Um, so McKenna's theory was that in fact, all these initiates were having um, uh, uh, a BC version of a LSD trip 
But then you'd expect McKenna to say that because he was very keen on LSD. But um, I'm sure that they had some kind of very supernatural experience because they all kept their mouth shut afterwards. And you think if a lot of people went to a particular, I don't know, let's say a theatrical performance, they would come out and some would say good things about it and some would say bad things about it. But in the case of the theatrical performance at Eleusis, nobody said anything about it. Um, they all kept their mouth shut. And that was probably hundreds, probably even thousands of people who went through those mysteries. Um, I, I wish I had been there, but uh, unfortunately that's not going to happen. So interesting. Thank you for having me.